Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a different book prize shortlist because really variety is the spice of life. <laughs> um, and this is for the Goldsmiths Prize. Um, and so this is a prize that is about finding kind of innovation within fiction. And so whereas this can sometimes mean that like parts of the shortlist can seem like this sort of mix of weird and wonderful books that are kind of doing strange things, it's also mostly just about how the books themselves kind of shape um, or kind of take the, the form of a novel and do something quite new and inventive with it. Um, and this is a prize that I've been really enjoying for the last couple of years. I kind of, I hadn't really paid too, too much attention to it before then. Um, and I've been really enjoying reading ones that I have. Um, and it's about to come up for its 10 years as well. And I'm going to be doing um, a special video as well of doing uh, all 10 uh, winners when this shortlist winner is announced. Um, but for the time being, I'm going to talk about the shortlist. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about them all. So let's get started. First up, alphabetically by author surname, we have Somebody Loves You by Mona Arshi. Um, and I spoke about this when I uh, was talking about the Republic of Consciousness uh, long list. And it, it is worth noting the Republic of Consciousness um, prize, the Goldsmiths prize and the International Booker. There's a bit of a, a kind of thing going there with sort of they often there'll be a couple of books that sort of appear in each of those um, shortlists just because I think the nature of it, right? Who's publishing some of the weird and wonderful books? Often small indie presses. Small indie presses also publish quite a lot of weird and wonderful books in translation. All that kind of jazz. Anyway, so we see a bit of a, a crossover there. But anyway, Somebody Loves You um, was uh, shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness shortlist um, uh, a prize as well. Um, and it's just this really bizarre book. I think I, every time I've sort of tried speaking about what actually happens in the book, I find it quite hard to pin down because in many ways it's this sort of slightly bizarre unfurling narrative um, from a young girl. And she's talking about various things she deals with. So her kind of growing sense of who she is, um, sort of racism and sort of discrimination she faces from those around her who don't quite fully get what, you know, who she is or what's happening in her life. Um, but also she sort of selectively for a bit is mute in one of the books, uh, in, in part of this book rather. And during that time, we kind of get this rich inner life of her world and this sort of kind of quite quite interesting and quite strange in some ways to go into this uh, perspective of a young girl and kind of understand what's going on around her and the the story is like just sort of bounces off kind of various walls it's sort of a bit you know little things happening and it's sort of quite childlike at times but also incredibly perceptive and wise um at other times so a really interesting little book um i really want to reread it just because I I read it and I remember really enjoying it and then afterwards sort of found myself being like what was what went on there again because it's just such a an interesting book it's so sort of um not scrambled but you know lots of sort of short chapters or short sections where she sort of goes off on these tangents which in many ways is that sense of form and function meeting right of she's a, a young girl with quite a lot of distracted thoughts and um, the book kind of mirrors that in itself as well. Next up, we have Seven Steeples by Sarah Baum, or Sarah Baum, rather. Um, and I really loved this. It's it's a book that, again, on paper really shouldn't work. It um, is essentially about this couple who are both introverted, both really enjoy being outside and being alone. And they get into a relationship and decide to move in together and move to this area near Seven Hills and Seven Steeples and all these sorts of things. And the little kind of house they move into um, sort of slowly crumbles throughout the book um, as we spend year after year. We basically watch them through seven years where they don't climb the mountain that they came and moved there to go and do. And so this book kind of is almost that whole premise of this book seems to be almost nothing happening. It's almost a kind of waiting for Godot kind of style thing of like year five, they didn't climb the mountain. Um, <laughs> and it's, again, that shouldn't work, but it's so lyrically beautiful. I just found the writing of this so captivating. And I think the thing that I also thought was really interesting here was that um, it plays with that idea of them not doing anything and talks a little bit more about this sort of wider sense of ruin that they have in their lives. This house slowly falls apart and because they're not working and because they're not 
paying money to sort of repair various bits of these things. It's all kind of cobbled together and we watch how it's, uh, you know, as it sort of slowly disintegrates. So, you know, uh, for example, part of a door frame needs repairing and they kind of cobble over it with, you know, whatever they've got around the house and then it gets worse and then they find new things to try and repair it with. And so by the end of this seven years, this house we've had in such vivid detail um, is just the complete ruin. Um, but they've, their relationship is sort of, their whole lives have sort of narrowed increasingly to the point where they are just in their little world and they don't really speak to anybody else. Um, and there was something really quite profound and quite moving, I thought, about how this book does this, which I was not expecting. Um, and again, just so beautifully written. I thought this was just a dream to read. Um, and the, I like the kind of frustration of the audience sort of um, expectation that you as a reader are watching a book where nothing really happens in many ways and, and sort of natural processes slowly take over a house. Um, yeah, and I'm kind of glad that it doesn't try and do this big grand thing at the end of like, and they wander, because I thought it was going to go basically into COVID book territory and be like, and they wander out into the world and kind of Rip Van Winkle style, um, you know, 20 years have passed and everything's changed. You know, I was worried it'd be that, but actually it doesn't. And I think that's to this book's strength that it does something really quite clever and profound in the background instead. Next up, we have Maddie Mortimer with Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies. I've done a solo review of this book. Um, obviously, it was long listed for the Booker as well. Um, it won the Desmond Elliott. It's probably going to be long listed or short listed for some other prizes along the way. It's a great book, I think. And um, it basically tells a sort of relationship, uh, tells a story of a relationship between a mother and daughter, particularly looking at a cancer diagnosis and uh, the the book kind of expands its form to kind of play around with some of these things right of sort of um one character has like stuck out notes and things that are sort of in the book almost of um you know things that have been written and passed around in school or things that she's searching online or whatever and it plays around quite a lot with the the notion of text in the book um you know it's not just just the kind of standard bit of writing it you know different fonts different kind of shapes and colors are used to kind of help identify i guess what this um what, what's happening in this relationship um for these uh, these two women um i found it really quite profound and really quite beautiful and moving um and i think in terms of the goldsmiths that does make sense that it's sort of a there's a, a more traditional story in there but it's also doing a lot of things with the text itself it's playing around and innovating around that as well so that totally makes sense. I think that's the thing that's interesting with a prize like this is um, some books that naturally fit the goldsmith's sort of um, criteria are ones full of, you know, things like uh, Duck's Newburyport with, you know, run on sentences and um, expanding the form in that sense. Some are that they subvert other expectations. And I, I went to a talk um, with uh, between um, the last two winners of the Goldsmith Prize, so um, Isabel Weidner um, and M. John Harrison, and they were talking about how for them innovative fiction is often playing around more with audience expectations or the types of things that traditionally happen in stories instead of that. And I think Maps does kind of two quite interesting things side by side here because it, it tells what feels like a traditional story in parts that also has some quite new and innovative elements to it, but also plays around with the text on the page as well. Um, so a really interesting book and a really moving one. Um, I know it's not for everybody, particularly given people's personal experiences of, of the subject matter, but um, an interesting book nonetheless. Next up, we have Pieces by Helen Oyoyemi. And I, <laughs> this is a book I've really struggled to know what to say about. Um, I listened to the audiobook and part of me is not sure if having physically read it would have made it easier or not. Um, but I'll try and do my best. Essentially, there is a train journey, well, a few train journeys sort of at the heart of this book. And which almost doesn't seem to be the point, but also kind of is the point. This book is sort of delightfully weird at times. It sort of, um, there are various mongoose, mongoose? What is the plural of mongoose? There are, there is a mongoose and there is maybe another mongoose <laughs> and whatever the plural is of that word. Um, and they, it's this sort of bizarre thing where at times it felt like I was in um, 
his dark materials with sort of you know characters having kind of conversations with these uh with these animals uh, or sort of demons from um from his dark materials and other times where it's sort of deadly serious talking about incredibly brutal things happening around these characters and in many ways these sort of train journeys seem to bend notions of time um of logic at times this book feels really fantastical and otherworldly at times it's incredibly real um and so i think that's kind of the thing i felt as a reader for this book was constantly being on the wrong foot um and i think that's the intention of this book in some ways in a good way i think of never quite letting you settle into what kind of story this might be instead we talk a bit more about some quite serious political topics um but we also then have a mongoose um so you know draw your own conclusions it's a it's a weird and wonderful book i still fully don't know how i feel about it i, I kind of vary every so often between thinking like that was really funny and really clever and also thinking was this intentionally obtuse um still not sure maybe that's the point uh but yeah an interesting book nonetheless then we have Plek. Uh, there are more things by Yara Rodriguez Fowler. Um, and this book uh, I loved, I found really just engaging in so, so many ways. Um, it's the kind of story mostly really between two women um, in London, um, one of whom is um, is Brazilian and sort of has moved from Brazil to London. The other has sort of Brazilian sort of family, but has sort of been raised almost as a sort of almost outside of that right they've sort of she feels herself to be very much a londoner and doesn't feel as attached to that other side and so there's this sort of this thing of these two women sort of understanding each other's relationships but in terms of the actual kind of what would make this maybe a bit more innovative um is kind of how it plays around with text then on the page and the whole plec joke thing um on um, kieran's discord comes from the fact that at one point in this book a character is typing um i'm just trying to find it here we go is is typing um and it just has plec 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 um on the page and that's the sort of sound of typing um right at the beginning of the book as well we kind of get these instructions of you know when a, when um a character says these sorts of things or makes a certain sound make the sound with me um here we go um a note to you the reader when a song plays on the page listen to it out loud when the characters speak in chorus when they read from the iphone at meetings speak out loud with them um and so it's this whole kind of idea that you're it's a bit more of an almost an interactive book of these kind of these sounds are meant to bring bits to life i know that's not for everybody i actually found this incredibly charming um because I've read this pretty much in two sittings. It's about 400 or so pages, which sounds like a lot, but actually, you know, lots of these pages have very little text on them or will maybe be blank or whatever. And, it, you know, it, it kind of plays around a lot on the page with text itself. But I think what was especially clever for me about this was that silliness, like, you know, so-called so silliness of things like Plek or whatever else, at first seem like they're going to be these really sort of ridiculous kind of fanciful things. I occasionally found bits of this really moving and I was not expecting that because it slowly builds this sort of charm almost of you kind of really getting into the rhythm of this book and the way it tells the story. Um, and it got to a passage and I was like, this is beautiful. Like this is deeply moving and really clever. And um, there's it's almost like the sort of moment of like the clouds lifting and it kind of revealing kind of what's underneath I just thought it was really quite powerful and it, it says quite a lot about politics it says quite a lot about identity um but it also is just fun to read and I think has this sort of degree of silliness that I really warmed to across the book so yeah I, I really enjoyed this and I kind of hope it wins now as well for that reason and finally, the last book on the shortlist, Diego Garcia, uh, which is a, a two-person book. Um, Natasha Subramanian and Luke Williams wrote this together. Um, and interestingly, within the book itself, there is a moment where two characters are writing a book together. And so the book starts doing this sort of meta thing of referring almost to itself and, you know, what have you. Um, also, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's kind of got like little dog teeth marks um, all over it because basically I uh, I was dog sitting and left this on the side and was looking away for about a minute. <laughs> I 
and I look back over and it's just this dog walking around, this sort of Labrador walking around with Diego Garcia in its in its mouth, looking quite chilled. He didn't destroy anything more about it, but just walking around with it, um, sort of, you know, fighting the good fight and spreading the word about <laughs> Fitzcarraldo. Um, but anyway, Diego Garcia. Um, so the name comes from an island that um, was sort of, has basically been passed around a fair bit um, and there's a sort of political situation that's explained right at the beginning of this book where these islands and the sort of Chagossian islands were taken um, originally from the, the kind of people who lived there and then the British Empire uh, sort of took took it. Um, it was then also turned into a sort of US naval base and so these people have been displaced and moved and then the book itself deals with not only the political um, situation of that where you've got a couple of um, Chagossian people uh, in the book who sort of speak and kind of there's this sort of thing around Mauritius which sort of um, you know the kind of relationship there but then also it kind of plays around a lot with this idea these idea of power imbalances and, and power more generally so the power of the state um, there are sort of a few violent moments in this book that sort of seem to speak to the the state and sort of state apparatus um, then we've also got various other bits in this book that talk a little bit more about other um, aspects. So at times this book is quite silly and quite fun with kind of characters going and doing their own thing and it's sort of quite um, absurdist and almost um, kind of uh, hallucinatory, almost, you know, kind of these sort of weird and wonderful things happening. And then it has these incredibly profound moments of, of really punchy political um, topics as well, talking about it. Um, and so we have a character called Diego who is named after this island and we've got all these other things that are going on in this book. And I don't fully know, how, you know, I, I enjoyed this overall. I don't think I loved it. I think I maybe missed something that was kind of going on there. But I think there's a lot of really important, there are a lot of really important conversations happening in this book um, in a way that I don't think that you often... I, I've not seen something like this be approached in fiction in quite the same way um, before. And I think the the dual writer thing is quite interesting because at least in the book proper, um, like the, the, the book within the book, the kind of story of the book, um, we have the middle passage being interviews with somebody translated from um, a local Creole. Um, and it's sort of seen as that one of the authors did that translation and that's, that, that's their part and the rest of the book is somebody else. Um, but then actually looking at this, you're like, well, did two people still create this in that same way? Did the pattern still work? And it's kind of an interesting conundrum almost um, of how do two people share a book like that, um, which I thought was really interesting. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that is the shortlist of the Goldsmith Prize for this year. Um, probably by the time the video goes out, it will be just around the time that the winner is going to be announced. But um, at the risk of probably sounding quite stupid when I get this incredibly wrong. I am personally rooting for uh, Seven Steeples by Sarah, ba Sarah Baum and uh, There Are More Things um, by Yara Rodriguez Fowler. I loved Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies and would love to see that one um, pick up the prize as well. I must admit, I don't, like the, the other three books I, I enjoyed, I would not be angry to see them win. I just don't think I connected with them in quite the same way. I don't, th don't think I have that the same kind of relationship with them um, as I do with the other three. Uh, but nonetheless, um, a really great um, shortlist, really interesting to see these sort of new boundaries being pushed um, within fiction constantly and uh, really exciting. I hope you um, hope you enjoy these books if you've read any of them um, and I will be doing, a once the winner is announced, I'll be doing a collection of all 10 winners from the first 10 years of this prize um, as well. Take care, I've been Bob the Booker, speak to you all soon, bye bye.